Currently, wow, uh, <laughs> we are currently streaming uh, on the website. So, action. <laughs> Welcome. Ready? Hello, everyone. <laughs> Thanks for joining this evening at uh, Roots Week 2020 Reimagined, our theme, The Fierce Urgency of Now. I am Amy, Amy McCoy. I will be one of your co-hosts this evening. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. And I am uh, hailing from uh, the land of also known as Atlanta, Georgia. And I'm going to toss it to my fellow co-host to introduce herself. Hi, everyone. I'm Paige, uh, part of the operations team with Amy at Alternate Roots. I am the caretaker, peacemaker, and implementer on the operations team. And I'm here in Atlanta, the land of the Muskogee. Welcome. This evening, uh, we uh, will be blessed by Samuel uh, and his uh, panel. And I would like to uh, toss it to Sam uh, for his, uh, I'm sorry, let me describe the panel tonight. So in theater, too many times characters in, with disabilities are played by non-disabled actors, leaving the professional disabled actor behind and without work. In this conversation, the deep dive will focus on discussing this problem as, as a way of finding solutions on how to promote the work and artistry of the professional theater artist so he or she can be employed by theaters across the country. And again, uh, this will be hosted by Samuel Valdez, and I'm going to now just go over uh, a few things, and I hope our language justice partners here are present. Let's check. Mary Luisa? Maybe having some tech challenges. We can talk about a few other things. I guess. That would be great. <laughs> While we're waiting for our, uh, our language justice partners. Um, another accessibility feature that we have is closed captioning. And you can access that from the closed captioning feature at the bottom bar of your Zoom screen. And so that's going to be labeled. It's a little box labeled with CC. Uh, also, uh, our gender equity work group reminds us that uh, we should all change our profile names to include our pronouns, um, as you can see right below me um, in this fashion. Yeah, just include your name and your pronouns and any other information you'd like for us to know. And that can be done by pressing the little box uh, to the side to the, on the right up hand, the right hand corner. Uh, with the three dots and just go to rename and you can rename yourself from there. Are we ready with Bancha? I think we may have had a mix up with scheduling. Okay. And so unfortunately, I don't think we will have um, interpretation this evening. We're still in our uh, in our growing phase. So we appreciate you all um, and apologies for that. But we will make sure that we have um, our interpretation set for tomorrow. Thank you very much. Thank you, Wendy. And um, you, as you watch, you will see a few 
slides happen across of your screen. Um, one that just uh, went by was our alternate routes mission. Um, all of these uh, items are also present on our website. So we, in, in, in respect of time, we won't go through all of them. So oh, you could go to the next slide for me, Lauren. Thank you. And uh, we, as uh, to honor our Native and Indigenous uh, cultures, and uh, also to acknowledge that this is stolen land that we currently occupy, we do land acknowledgments. Um, we would uh, support and encourage you to go um, to the information that you see on the screen. Um, and then also, uh, as you are here and able, if you would please uh, introduce yourself in the chat um with uh your name your pronouns and where you're hailing from and if you do know the uh original name or the people who originally inhabited your uh place please add that as well thank you so much and we uh, do uh, have community agreements uh we have And those are also posted on our website. Uh, just a few I'll go over. Um, we take care and responsibility for ourselves and our own physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual needs. Uh, some of these are definitely uh, pertaining to being in the space together. Um, we give each other grace, knowing that the work of undoing oppressions is hard and we'll all mess up at some point. You can just keep going uh, with those. I do encourage if in, someone would please drop the link for the community agreements in the chat. People, you can click on that and uh, read them at full length. Uh, we appreciate your patience as we move through this. And without further ado, we will be moving into a video presentation. And as soon after that, you will be hearing and seeing I'm well about that and uh, take care. Okay. I do apologize. I did not give you this piece of information. The video will be on the website streaming just for connectivity reasons. So if you do have the ability to go to the website, um, we would put a link in the chat for that, but please just keep your volume from the website down so you don't hear a echo when you come back into the Zoom space. Thank you. The video will be presented uh, a little later in the session. Oh, so the, does that mean we can go, Uh, we will be starting uh, you right now, Sam? Yeah. Hello, my name is Samuel Valdez. I'm uh, my pronoun that he can make his. Uh, I'm in uh, Tijuana, Mexico, Puerto Rico, San Diego, California. I sit in the Kumaya land. And um, I am here today to talk about a very important subject, which is disabled professional and field artists in the industry. We have a great uh, group of panelists who are willing to, to, to talk about what's going on in the world, in the country right now uh, with disability and theater. Uh, I hope you already enjoy what we got for you. Uh, so why don't we go first with Hillary. Hi everyone, this is Tallery. Thank you, Samuel. 
Um, my name is Tallery McRae. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I, um, uh, I am wearing a purple sweatshirt. I'm a cisgendered white woman. I've got kind of brown tussled hair and I am out of doors. So behind me on my screen, you can see kind of the white brick of uh, my apartment building. Um, I live in Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, my particular neighborhood is the land of the Osage, the Shawnee and the East Cherokee nations, and I have a disability. I have cerebral palsy. Um, and I'm going to pass it to, and I also uh, work with National Disability Theater, and I was the co-director on the uh, performance and production that we're going to be talking about today. And I will pass it to Sean. Hello. My name is Sean Fanning, and I'm a scenic designer. My pronouns are he, him, his. I'm a white cisgender man with short brown hair and a beard, wearing a gray National Disability Theater t-shirt. Uh, behind me is my design studio, which has blue walls, a green drafting table, and a window with lots of natural light. I live in San Diego, California, which was once part of Mexico. And prior to being colonized, that was originally the land of the Kumiye people. Uh, I'm disabled. Uh, my status is deaf, hard of hearing. Thank you. And I'll pass it to Jacole. Hi, everybody. My name is Jacole Kitchen. I use she, her, hers pronouns. I am a cisgender, light-skinned black woman wearing purple glasses with hair pulled back. Uh, I am wearing a gray overshirt with a little pink and white dress peeking out from underneath. Um, I am in San Diego, California, which is land, as has been acknowledged here, that was stolen from the Kumaye people. So happy to join you. So now we will go back to Tallory to talk a little bit about what is she doing and what is important of the work that we are doing with the National Disability Theatre. Thank you, Samuel. This is Tallory. Um, National Disability Theater was founded in 2018, and our very first uh, organizational artistic project was with La Jolla Playhouse in San Diego. And today we're going to be spending time talking a little bit about the 2020 uh, pop tour, the performance outreach P tour. Um, that, um, Jacole's laughing at me, um, that was produced by La Jolla Playhouse in partnership with National Disability Theater. And so um, this, uh, this particular performance space uh, is typically um, for a new work that is developed with an audience of uh, young people in mind. And for 2020, um, the new work had an entirely disabled um, artistic team, um, design team, um, and we worked with several different um, artists and performers with disabilities as well. Um, and um, it was a great um, starting point for a National Disability Theater. Like I said, we're a very young organization and we're kind of moving through um, our own growth, but we wanted to take this opportunity to pause and just tell you a little bit more about um, the pieces that put that project together. Um, Samuel, am I heading into um, accessibility specifics or just doing the introduction at this moment? Uh, you can do accessibility specifics. Okay. Yes. Um, so uh, this is Tallery again. When I am not um, a, when I'm not a director at La Jolla Playhouse, which is most of the time I'm not, um, I am also a teaching artist. And so I really um, believe in kind of what are some of the concrete takeaways that we can take from making a space that's accessible, right? Or making a space that's access centered. Um, and so there's kind of three things that um, were a little bit of a guidepost as National Disability Theater was forging this new partnership, this new um, project with La Jolla Playhouse, when we thought about how to make this space accessible for so many um, artists in really a compact amount of time. And so the three things that I find really helpful um, is, uh, and they all start with C, because I'm a teacher and I'm cheesy that way. So the first one is communication, right? How are we communicating early? How are we communicating often? How are we communicating in different 
um, modalities so that everyone is getting the information and able to process information and respond in a way that works for them. Um, when you think about, I love that we that this panel started with an intention of language justice, right? And so um, National Disability Theater tried to be as mindful as possible of not privileging one mode of communication over another one. So that was the first C. The second C that we really um, tried to think about a lot is how do we make this um, accessible, inclusive, professional space was we really thought about choices, right? How do we create an equitable space where everyone that's involved has the, has the ability to make an equitable choice for how they can engage? Um, and so that had to do with just being really flexible, right? Looking at a professional um, rehearsal calendar, looking at a professional design process, how could we give people choices to engage in ways that really worked for them? Um, and I have to say that La Jolla Playhouse was really game for this um, kind of approach. Um, sometimes it was as simple as working with a designer and saying like, let's think about the best way to um, process your paycheck on this project. What's gonna be the choice that works best for you in your life? That's just one small example that was actually really easy to implement as soon as we all were in the habit of checking in about people's choices. Um, and then the third piece um, that we'll talk about um, throughout the session um, is um, really the creativity that comes along with creating that kind of accessible, inclusive space. Um, we needed a lot of creativity. Um, I think sometimes when you talk about accessibility on kind of a superficial level, um, it can be really easy to think like, oh, I'm gonna get this one checklist, right? Or I'm gonna make this space um, universally accessible, which always makes me nervous because if you're having a space that's really access centered, then you're, sometimes your access needs are gonna compete, they're gonna overlap, they're gonna kind of get in each other's way. And so that's where we found we really needed as much creativity um, uh, to kind of get through that, uh, to navigate that space together and say, does everyone feel um, that they have the support they need moving forward? How can we make that happen? Um, yeah. So um, you're seeing on the screen in front of you, just a slide, there is a, a young person uh, with white skin and light skin and kind of brown hair. Um, she has two um, crutches with armbands um, towards the top of her elbow and then handles down below. Um, she's wearing a red sweatshirt and jeans and a sign uh, next to her, kind of in a picket style sign says, Emily Driver's Great Race Through Time and Space by A.A. A. Brenner and Greg Mazzini. Gala. So A.A. Brenner and Greg Masgala were the um, writers on the production um, and they wrote a great 45-minute um, time-traveling adventure in which the main character Emily, who was disabled, um, had to navigate in her real life and in a dream world the forces of ableism and how to address them in 2020. Um, and that's my elevator pitch on, the, on what the show is about. And it really, um, Emily was able to travel back and forth in time to learn more about disability history and disability rights. Um, so I'm gonna pause there. That'll give you just a tad of what the actual um, content of the show was and check with Samuel to see if we're on uh, schedule. Yes, can we go to the next slide please? And uh, next slide, thank you. And um, this, thank you, Samuel. Um, this is a slide, it's black and white. At the top, it says disabled ensembles, a sampling. Um, this is just a reminder to everyone in this session that um, National Disability Theater is not the only uh, performance group in the country that does this work. In fact, uh, its founding in 2018 was very much uh, informed by and uh, inspired in the good way um, by a lot of the other work that's been going on around the country. So we encourage you to look at that. And there's also, if we go to the next slide, 
um, which is, has a slightly different heading. It's called inclusive ensembles, a sampling, again, just a sampling, knowing that there are also some professional theater companies throughout the country that are really dedicated to having non-disabled and disabled performers work together. Um, so what National Disability Theater um, aims to do in its mission is to really think about how um, these different pockets of really excellent um, disabled work, whether it's an inclusive um, theater work or it's a primarily disabled ensemble, um, how does that, how do those um, companies have a space to talk to each other? How do those companies have a space to come together? And how can um, a company like NDT um, be a resource for different theaters around the country, not just um, not just have its own home space and its own and its own uh, home theater and home season, but do partnerships just like with La Jolla. So we'll um, go to the next slide there. Ooh, um, can I pass this one to Sean Fanning to talk a little bit about our um, workshop and then what that meant going into production? Certainly. Um, yeah, this workshop really was, was the first time that we were all kind of in the same room together. And um, I immediately was inspired just by the adaptations that were made to do this reading. Um, if you can see in this image, these two wheelchairs being pushed together with clip lights being added to them. And this is supposed to represent a car. And so I saw this during this workshop, and I said, it's done. You know, this, we, we've already, I mean, I'll talk about this a little bit later when I go into, like, my actual panel discussion. But I think that this was the sort of thing that really set off uh, what, we, what we grew to learn during the production, which is really like building off of the adaptations that we normally make. Yeah. Thank you, Tyler. Did, did you want me to, to expand and do my whole discussion at this point, or are we going to do that? Yes, after this one, yes. Go on. So, yes, Sean, keep going. This is Tyler. Okay, great. Well, so I'm, I'm actually I'm here to talk about the concept of disability again, and also to discuss what it means um, to collaborate with disabled artists. So, disability gain, or originally we called it wheelchair gain was a term that we coined early on in our process on this show. Uh, the idea was inspired by the concept of deaf gain within the deaf and hard of hearing community. So what does deaf gain mean? Um, especially for those of us who are deaf from birth, we have never felt like we had anything to lose. So why do you call it a hearing loss? Hearing loss places value on something that we potentially don't need. We're not broken people, so why do we need to be fixed? The word that uh, I think fits us the most is adaptation. Our disability gives us a unique perspective and an important voice, and it also requires that we code switch constantly, whether we're functioning more as a, as a deaf individual who uses ASL and relies upon interpreters, or whether we're mainstream and um, whether we are oral, as I was throughout my life and gain our information from speech reading and putting together clues from context and detective work. Um, I mean, I believe that because of these adaptations, having my disability has made me more attuned to situations, more clued into body language, more sensitive to tones or emotions in the room. It's also made me a very visual communicator. And so I often feel that being deaf is the reason I'm an artist. So having a disability isn't just a challenge is also an opportunity. And the creative team for Emily Driver's Great Race may have been probably one of the first all disabled creative teams. Um, the first meeting uh, for the show was like the first time in my own life that I found myself sitting at a table, looking around it, and feeling this shared understanding and experience with others. I didn't feel alone anymore. And I didn't feel like I was trying to pass for hearing or trying to battle my way through a meeting where people were talking over each other. So being able to bring my own experience about what it means to adapt and innovate to the table with other wonderful artists I worked with allowed us to sort of come up with this concept, disability gain. And what that means is that when you have an artist in a wheelchair, that wheelchair is not a nuisance to design around. 
it's an opportunity to create something. So just between us, as a designer, putting a vehicle on stage in traditional situations is a real pain. It's always a problem. And when we look to the adaptations that somebody already brings to the table, we discover that there's already a vehicle and it really works. So instead of patting the wheelchair, embrace it, play it up, make it a part of what you're doing. Um, I think that there's something to be said for identity and perception and something that we all discovered with the common thread running beneath the creative team. Like the characters that we represented in Emily Driver, being disabled is a, it's a part of one's personality makeup and it does inform how we live our lives, but it doesn't define us as people or as artists. We're not shallow two-dimensional figures that are only represented by our disabilities. Those make up a fraction of who we are. We all share the power to choose our identity and decide our function and determine how we most accurately, accurately but wish to be portrayed. So while disability informs our ideas as collaborators, ultimately we also must have full agency over the narrative of the disabled character on stage and how they interact with the world. So, I, I mean, I'm glad to be here because I think that this plays into a much larger discussion on representation. When it comes to selecting a creative team, this sort of representation matters, not only for the sake of equity, but because diversity also means that we're able to bring unique voices and perspectives to the creative process and elevate all of our work. And that's what I gotta say, so thank you. This is Tallery. Sean, can we advance to the next slide? And I'm going to have you talk just a little bit more about sure. um, your set design. So, um, yes. So talk more because you're great. I'm done. <laughs> the following, the following uh, few uh, uh, pictures are about your set design. So you can talk about them. Uh, so, the yes, speaking, speaking about the design elements here, we were really looking for a way to create an open space where we could imagine going on a journey. Um, we have this idea of this wonderful sort of Rand McNally map that we use to sort of describe the process of the main character during the show. Um, and as you can see, we really borrowed that original image that we saw in the reading and said, hey, we can make two wheelchairs, put them together, and it becomes a car. If you want to advance to the next slide, I think we had like a picture of the, of the designs. So this is what we actually came up with. And what I love about this is that we've, we've, it's a hybrid of both a set piece and wheelchair. And we've really featured and highlighted the wheelchair as a part of the the form follows function idea of this car. Um, it had two pieces that sort of hinged open and then closed in front of the wheelchair, but still allowed the user's full range of movement. If you can move to the next slide. So here were some drawings that I did to sort of put these ideas together. Um, and there was another vehicle in the show that was supposed to be a bus. And so I really wanted to find a way to embrace the wheelchair, let us see the wheelchair, but also have something that suggests a bus. So it's not like we're trying to hide any of this framework. I think that there's another wonderful picture of calories. Oh, well, here's, here's another side view of the car. So you can really see that this was just connected to the wheelchair. And I really have to thank the production staff of La Jolla Playhouse for being very clever and innovative and working with this challenge. Look at this thing. I mean, this thing folded up flat and then attached to a wheelchair and you immediately get the sense that it's a bus, which is a very simple, simple idea um, and so effective. And so that, that was sort of the guiding principle of this whole production was how do we, how do we have fun with it? because that's really one of the things that you miss when you're trying to get your head around designing a space for accessibility is you feel like you have all of these rules and all of these restrictions. When you start working with the actors and discussing what works for you, 
And how do we have fun with this? How do we create a performance space that allows you to bring out the most in your performances? Um, and it, a lot of that is collaboration. And it's not something that I could always decide coming into a room. We have to have those conversations. So I think that we can learn a lot about this type of process when we're thinking about implementing things in other theatrical productions. So I was very proud of this whole production. Thank you. Thank you, Sin. And now we would like to hear from Jake Hall, who is a representative of La Jolla Playout. Uh, Jake Hall. Hi, everybody. Jacole Kitchen from La Jolla Playhouse. Uh, I just love looking back at those pictures. We had so much fun creating it. I actually just want to hear Sean talk about more about the car. I look at the pictures and I'm like, ooh, tell him how it opened, because it was so cool the way it just hinged together and then the panels went off so the people could get in and out of the car. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say a little bit, but I, I want to hear more about the car. Um, and even the way the, the wheelchairs just clipped together so they moved together as one. It was so much innovation and it was so fun getting to go down to the design studio every day and see the different progress that was being made on on this it was it was just so fun this was such a this project was such a joy to be in and uh, to be a part of and to be a part of the creation of and uh sean and tallery have heard me say a number of times that it was so wonderful being at the table and because I as a, a black woman I often am the only one of said group at the table as was spoken that you know a lot of the artists with disabilities often when they're there at the table they feel like they're the only one and it brought me so much joy to push back from the table and just watch this group of people commune and speak a shared language and and not getting jokes and going that's okay i don't need to laugh at that joke they're laughing it's fun this is good this is good it was just it was so wonderful just to be in that room and to be part of the creation um but one of the things that they brought me on uh this panel to speak about is really just creating opportunities and this uh production it had a number of opportunities, but it also came as, especially as a casting director and as a producer, um, it came with a number of challenges as well. At one point, I literally looked at the team and I said, okay, so you are telling me we need a trans disabled woman of color to play this role. And they're like, uh-huh, yeah, that's, that's, what we're, that's what we're telling you. And I'm just like, okay. Um, and we, you know, we dove in, we dove in hard. I would say we did not meet all of the criteria for that particular uh, character, but the representation of what was necessary for the character, uh, that, that for the person that that character was based on, we were 100% true to that. And that is uh, what was important. We had a cast that was made up primarily of people of color and as well as people with disabilities. And so the, uh, the, the cross section and the intersectionality, as we call it, that took place on this production was just astounding. But again, it's about creating opportunities. And the one thing that I learned and that continues to uh, stay implemented into our work and uh, at the La Jolla Playhouse is the way you communicate. Going back to what Tallery was saying in the very beginning is, how you're communicating, what language you're using, um, especially again, as, as artists of color, we would always see something that says, all open to all ethnicities. And we're like, okay, but do you mean it? And you know the language, we all have that language that when we see and it's like, oh, oh, you mean it. And working with National Disability Theater helped us to open up language on our breakdowns that really showed, no, we are open to um, seeing actors with disabilities, actors of all disabilities in our productions, not just for the productions that are specifically have uh, these char disabled character, you know, we are open. And so having open language within um, our breakdowns and, and in just also thinking more about space and being able, and it goes with language, but it goes also with intentionality of thinking about the spaces that we are auditioning in and the spaces that we are rehearsing in and taking a good look and making sure 
that those spaces are fully accessible and then putting that on the breakdown as well and saying rehearsals, auditions, and performances will take place in accessible spaces. That is language that makes you go, oh, oh, they mean it. Okay, you know, and it's such a simple thing to put on there because it's also the truth. Our spaces, you know, and we, if it's not the truth, then we need to take a step back and go, why isn't that the truth? How can we adjust? What space can we utilize that would make that the truth versus going, oh, no, that's not true. Let's take it off the breakdown. So um, it's, it's really a, a deepening of the intentionality of the work to make sure that whatever communities we are making sure know, need to know they are embraced within our work, know that. Now I want to hear more about the car. This is Tallery. Jacole, I have one more quick question for you. Can you give just a couple examples, like concrete examples of how um, some things have shifted at the Playhouse? You mentioned like, you mentioned like your um, breakdown and some other things, but I know um, since our project together, you, so, sometimes I'll get a text from Jacole where she's like, new, new thing. And then it's just really exciting to see the actual organizational um, processes shift. Oh gosh, see, and, and in all honesty, these things are being so much, becoming such commonplace where I'm like, ooh, what are we talking about? What did we do? What was good? What did we do? Um, I will say one example, um, and this, I don't, I, I feel like it's a good example, but it also makes me go, but is it? Um, Sean Fanning is somebody that, uh, La Jolla Playhouse in Sandy, he is a gem in the city of San Diego and has worked at uh, all of the theaters here in town in some capacity and has designed a number of pop tours before our partnership with National Disability Theater. And uh, there was a moment where, of course, when uh, Tallery and Mickey came to us and said, well, this is what we want to do. We're like, we've got a scenic designer. All right, what else we got? You know, it was just like, done. We, Sean is somebody that we already know and love. No, 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 no. So then we did get to put together this full creative team that was all um, artists with disabilities. And then as we were putting the uh, design team together for the 2021 tour, we're looking at this list of people and going, all right, this, this feels good. This feels good. I think we're ready to put, uh, I think we're ready to put offers out. And, and I looked at the list and, and spoke with my colleagues at the Playhouse and I said, we just went from doing a production with a full design team of artists with disabilities and this list has none. And we, Reevaluated. We looked back at our list. We were like, you are absolutely right. That is not how we are going to do business moving forward. Um, and we, uh, sh uh, Evan Easton, who was the sound designer on um, Emily Driver's Great Race, will be the sound designer for the 2021 production um, of Pick Me Last by Idris Goodwin. And that's, it's such a small step. That's why I'm, I'm like, it shouldn't, it almost shouldn't feel like a point in the right direction because it took a stop and a step to get there, you know, but we are stopping and we're acknowledging and we are, um, we're checking ourselves in, in, in every place that we need to be checked and we're holding ourselves accountable and, and we are looking to our partners to hold us accountable as well. What else did I do, Tallery? What else did we do? <laughs> okay, uh, do you call? Samuel, you muted. I'm sorry, my computer is crazy. Uh, one, uh, one thing else I would like to, uh, for you to go to talk about is what changes happen while you were touring the show at sports. I know that there was a change in one of the sports that was really a groundbreaker for the project. Can you Thank talk you. about that? Yes, please. Thank you. Um, and Tallery, by all means, feel free, please, to jump in. Um, because you were very much a part of this process as it was initially happening. Um, so the pop tour, one of the things, and this is another major change that we have implemented into um, our just process of creating the pop tour is 
We um, have added an extra step into our screening process of the, the schools that we're going to go into. Our stage managers and, and production team would always go in. We had a checklist to make sure, you know, this is good, this is good, we got what we need. Um, but accessibility has become um, paramount and, and gone to the top of the, the list in that. Um, and we, for this production, we did, we double, triple checked everything, all of the schools that we were going to be touring to. But our very first school uh, where we previewed, this is a school that we've had a longstanding relationship with, Sequoia Elementary in San Diego. We have started every pop tour probably for the last eight years at Sequoia Elementary. They allow us to, to uh, tech and, and do the, our previews in their space. And so Sequoia did not get the screening that the rest of the schools did because we went, oh, we know Sequoia. Yeah, Sequoia's cool. No, we're all there every year. We, we know them, cool, 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 cool. And we went in and we got there and it was not cool. Um, the, the stage was not accessible. Um, and we, as, as the pop tour, the touring production, because we uh, were forming cafeteriums and whatever space happens to be available, we're very, uh, we're quick to adjust. Okay, you, we can't use the stage here, da, 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 da. let's go down here. Usually, the, uh, it's because we can't get the, um, the stage pieces on. And so we just go, okay, cool. We'll just do it in front of the stage. We still have enough room for an audience. Okay, no worries, perfect. This was different. The reason that we could not perform on the stage was because it wasn't accessible to our actors. Our actor couldn't get on the stage. And so we were, but we, so we kind of, we, but we, it wasn't as full of a click as it should have been at that moment. We were still like, adjust, okay, whew, yeah, we're down here. It was the principal, again, because we have this long going relationship with the, the principal comes in and he goes, hey, why are you guys on the floor? What are you, what are you doing here? And we let him know the situation. Um, and he, he said, no, there, there is a, there is a, uh, a ramp, but nobody had the key to, or no, this one didn't have one. That's right. This school didn't have one. Am I right, Tallery? This one didn't have one. This, yeah, this school didn't have one. And so the principal was just, he went into action. And because, and the worst, oh, that's right. I do love telling the story. The thing that makes it like, the, that broke all of our hearts about this is so the principal went into action. He was like, okay, great. No problem at all. I'm going to get on the phone. The, the, uh, the janitorial staff, the head janitor at Sequoia Elementary, I wish I knew his name and I wish somebody on our education staff was on here right now. Because this man is, he championed everything that we did. And it was the principal and the head of the janitorial staff that were relentless and put in orders that they said were going to take months to, uh, months to take. And they said, no, months isn't good enough. And within two weeks, Sequoia Elementary had a temporary um, ramp that was put in. And then they had orders for the lift that would be put in. So yeah, we're like, okay, win for us. The thing that made it sad that it took us to come in and make that change, there was a student at Sequoia Elementary School who had been going there for a number of years and was a wheelchair user, full-time wheelchair user, and was in the choir. And her wheel could not get up to that stage to perform with her, uh, with her classmates in her wheelchair. And there would be, there was uh, somebody that they offered to, oh, well, we can carry you. And, she, she wouldn't, she wasn't gonna have somebody carry her. This child, every day for choir practice, got her way up those stairs to be able to be up there with her classmates and perform. But it took La Jolla Playhouse and National Disability Theater coming into that school and not being able to perform for real action to be taken. So yes, the action was taken and it was taken throughout San Diego County. This wasn't the only school that this ended up uh, being a, a situation for and real change has been made in the cafetoriums of San Diego County, benefiting so many students. The pop tour reaches more than 20,000 20, students a year. How many of those students or students with disabilities for the, for the very first time, not only saw themselves represented on stage so directly, but also had impl got change implemented in their school that would better benefit them moving forward. It's just, it's, it's, it's beautiful and astounding, but it's also heartbreaking that that's what it takes. This is Tallery, and I know Samuel's gonna get mad at me because we have to do some Q&A, but I also just wanna say that 
part of the play of Emily Driver was our main character who was 12 going back through time and space to look at um, the mainstream disability rights movement, right? And so the final scene in our play was actually the character of Emily um, uh, encountering and reenacting the Capitol crawl that happened in 1990, um, right before the passage of the Americans with Disabilities Act. So to go into Sequoia Elementary and hear that there had been a student that had to crawl up the steps to get to her choir practice, when that was part of our play, um, was really, many of us had a very visceral response to that and we were really happy that it ended um, with that happy ending where the, you know, where change happened. Um, but it just really hit home for us that it was a really important um, piece to be literally bringing into the schools because I got to tell you when La Jolla Playhouse came to National Disability Theater and said, we'd love to do a project with you. It's going to tour to a bunch of elementary schools. We were like, that's going to be hard and it was but also super meaningful and i'm done that's it samuel thank you tallory uh it for all of that that's a wonderful and this is an example of all the work that's being done right now and to open up doors for disabled actors in the country. Uh, I am working very, very closely with Hillary, uh being a part of National Disability Theater. I'm actually a board member of the organization and we are changing, we are trying to change these ideas. And the example of what happened at the beginning of the year with the Hoya Playhouse and National Disability Theater is huge. It's a huge. Uh, uh, in November of last year, I was called by Jacob because Jacob knows me uh, for, you know, doing zero around San Diego. And she called me and said, Samuel, I, I want you to come and audition. I was like, what? <laughs> You want me to audition for the Hoya Playhouse? What the hell, you know? It's like, but it really impacted the way I saw theater and the way I saw my work. It's like, you know, if, if the Hoya Playhouse is giving me a chance, a little chance to audition, then that means something. And from that audition, I, I wasn't casted, uh, but I started a relationship with Tallory and other folks about what we are doing. And then to follow this out, we would like to present two videos. One is from La Jolla Playhouse and the work that was done. And the other video is uh, about my work uh, with my show as a disabled professional artist. So what do we go to see the videos? And the link is on the chat. So let's go to the link. And just a reminder that you'll want to mute one of yours so that you're not getting that echo. And when we come back into the room, make sure you either close out or mute the live stream.
For those of you not in the chat in the streaming feature, if you want to see the chat, please go to the top right corner and there will be a bubble. You can click on that and that will open up the chat. Please remember to use your name and add your pronouns in that streaming chat. Also, this is a good time while we're queuing up the videos to take a stretch or refresh your water or just close your eyes from the screen for a few uh, until we hear the video. The world has two basic theories which are accompanied on myths on how man came to be. In the theory of evolution, Darwin tells us the reptiles, some sort of outburst from the dinosaurs, like we are some Cosmos episode starring Neil deGrasse Tyson. 1967, a child was born to a family family, my parents, came to us. Migrated into Los Estados Trinidad de America at the end of the 1950s, leaving behind the world of La Santa, a small village in the state of Zacatecas, Mexico. No le pidas al Hombre que te de una casa, agradece. Uh, a pa, I as a farm worker, but this I'm bringing in the familia into the field. At age three, I started attending this special school for the same children in Riverside. Life was normal. Okay, I will have to go to get you off my ass. Good. I don't want to be on your ass. Where well, your feel like it. Toma way. Toma boot. The next day, I had to go out at the court. And of course, the answer is no. Mejor que se encuentre una mujer piernuda, nalgona, que tenga de dónde agarrar. No sé lo que le estoy diciendo, hijo. Yeah, I do like sick women. But we were talking about you. Usted no se preocupe tanto por mí. Yo voy a estar bien. I have to worry about you. You're my father and I. I love you. The whole family loves you. To see myself in this situation, and I don't understand why I am not loved the way I want to be loved. I also get frustrated to, to, to see those men who abuse their wives when I would like only one single opportunity to care for some.
We are back, everyone. Samuel, is there another video? Samuel, you are muted. La Jolla Playhouse creates the opportunity for artists to tell stories the world needs to hear. From sharing the human kindness and hope that emerged from tragedy in Come From Away, to illuminating the forgotten stories of a generation lost in Cambodian rock band, we nurture the next generation of award-winning writers. I've just been really thankful and grateful for like the artistic home I've gotten to find at La Jolla Playhouse. You know, that like when I was a grad student there, I was just continually inspired and really just like delighted by the breadth and depth of like what the Playhouse was doing. By partnering with companies like National Disability Theater, we are creating change. Our 2020 pop tour for students was written directed, designed, and performed by artists with disabilities. A lot of theaters work really hard to talk about making an effort towards diversity and inclusion and accessibility. And often the way you see that play out at professional theaters of this size is they will put on a play that was directed by a non-disabled director and designed by non-disabled designers and written by non-disabled people but there will be one actor with a disability cast in the show. La Jolla Playhouse has been so incredible that they have joined National Disability Theater in saying that is amazing, but it's not it. Okay, so the two videos are two examples of people with disabilities doing uh, professional shows. Uh, and we wanted to share this with all of you to show you all the work that has been doing for the past uh, several uh, years and for my play uh, for the past several uh, three years. Uh, now, what I would like to do is, uh, I would like to open it up a few minutes for some questions from the uh, viewers. Uh, we are a little late, but I think we can take a couple of questions. Actually, we're not late at all. Um, we've got plenty of time for questions. Great, well, thank you, Wendy. You can drop them in the chat or you can raise your hand physically or with the blue hand razor thingy, whatever you call it, button in the Zoom. Hey, we have a question already. Yes, I, I can read them. Um, question from Lisa Mount. What brought you the greatest joy in collaborating with other disabled artists? Up in and say the story, the stories that we could tell each other that other people who were not in the room or on the fringes of the room didn't didn't completely understand it. It's like having a little secret society or a secret club where we're all like, oh, I remember back in elementary school this thing happened or something, and we could all sort of relate to each other by this by this sort of shared story of what it's like to sort of feel like you're pretending all the time walking through your life, going through your education and all of that. So it's like this full circle feeling of meeting people with the same kind of story. That's what I loved about it. Um, this is Tallery. Um, two things. One, Samwell mentioned like getting a call to come in for an audition at La Jolla Playhouse and just sitting through the audition process and watching everyone in the room get like 
viscerally excited when a performer with a disability came in. It was so different from my lived experience of walking in and being like, do I explain? Do I make a joke about it? Do we talk about it? Do I just keep going? Like, how do we do this? So like just having that space where not just me, but La Jolla Playhouse was excited. We were like, that one has a disability. Yay. Um, that was awesome. And then the second thing that I, uh, that will stay with me for a really long time was when we were doing the workshop production about a year ago, um, we did, we spent one rehearsal doing just like a physical warm up, you know, moving around the space. And it was the first time in my entire life that I could remember where I wasn't self conscious about doing a physical warm up in theater. I was like, oh, I'm, I'm not the only one limping around. So people aren't watching me. There's like nine other people to watch. Okay. Um, and I know that 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 happens in other affinity spaces, that there are a lot of um, theaters that, that provide that opportunity, but it was really my first time having that where I was in the room and totally comfortable and it was, it was really life-changing. Next question. Do you have cast or crew members who use facilitated communication or adaptive communication devices? This is Tallery. Um, again, uh, this project was, was National Disability Theater's first production, so we did not have anybody using adaptive communication um, for this particular show. But one of my favorite pastimes is to think about awesome characters that would be really neat if they used alternative communication, right? So um, the ghost of Jacob Marley in The Christmas Carol, right? Really any spooky like ghost thing. Like that's one of where my head goes dramaturgically is like how does that become disability gain and how does that help you tell the story? And then when you think about it like that, then there's really the options are limitless. All right, next question. What process do you all utilize to identify artists with disabilities to collaborate with? This is Tallery. Uh, any way possible, <laughs> right? Um, we were so lucky to put together such a great artistic team um, for this show and, and then use the local um, artists that we had. Um, I think even just um, partnering with La Jolla and other community partners to get the word out there that we were actively looking for and excited about people with disabilities was great. But one of the things that I think we have to do across communities um, within the disability community, outside of the disability community, within the intersectionality within the disability community, is I think we have to really start thinking about um, what it means to come out as disabled, what it means to say professionally that you're disabled, um, and how that um, is complicated and not always possible. Um, how sometimes even the identity of disabled is privileged in a way that doesn't always make space for people's lived experience. Um, so how, so moving forward, National Disability Theater really believes in the power of authenticity and also the complicated nature of what that means, right? That. Um, that while many of us experience disability and it can be a really positive thing, that in the world today, that can't always be true for everyone's experience of their own life. And you know, and I, I want to say that it's, it's a challenge to, to find disabled artists out there with disabilities. Uh, and um, part of the problem is, like Hillary said, they need to hide their disabilities. You know, me talking to the designers at the show, they, for years, they had to hide that they were disabled to work in the professional theater. And, you know, those are things that you go like, wow, how can that be possible? I'd like to add to that, this is Jacole. Um, as, 
as Tallery said, we got to get to a place of a great result, but that was by so much collaboration. Um, it started with uh, the list of folks that uh, National Disability brought to us, the folks that they had worked with, um, but also we had the constraints of wanting to keep as much, of as much local as we possibly could. The Pop Tour is a very San Diego local production, um, but it took so much reaching out. It took collaborating with agents who we know work with performers with disabilities. It took collaborating with the other theaters that we knew, um, uh, all the list, the family theater, the list that uh, Tallery put up earlier. We were reaching out to all of those people, asking everyone to reach out to their networks to then help us. Uh, also, again, because they're, one of the characters was a trans character, reaching out to our LGBT uh, a community and also saying what kind of what folks do you have that may uh, have some intersectionality with this but then also making sure that we are um, collaborating and speak and in constant conversation with uh, trans family services to make sure that it's that everything is happening authentically on each side of things so it was it was a community it was communities coming together to make it happen but the first thing was making sure that they knew we were, were very, very serious about wanting to hire performers with disabilities, uh, artists with disabilities. And one of the things that I, talking about uh, feeling like you have to hide, one of the actors, actually the actor who ended up playing Hugh in both our workshop production and the touring production, um, I've known this actor for a number of years. Number of years. Um, and I've known him through the community. I've known him through work that he's done with Samuel. I've, I've, I just, I've, I've known Paul for quite a while in this industry. It wasn't until he submitted for um, this role in Emily Driver that I knew he was a disabled performer. I, I had no idea. He's a, uh, he uses a prosthetic leg. Or what did he say? A removable leg. That's what he put on his resume. He had a removable leg. And I, and I, I had no idea. And it was just, I, I was amazed and, and in awe. But I was also kind of sad that I never knew that before. But anyway, so it's all the things coming together, but it definitely takes communication and community in order to make that happen. Actually, I want to tell you uh, that Paul was at Roots Week last year. He was with the group that I took. So uh, it's and he was a part of the cast of the show. Do we have any other questions or comments? Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll read a comment here. Uh, we've gotten all of the questions. Thank you, Samuel. How could this be possible? This really is underscoring the necessity of disability justice in all avenues of human experience. I am honored to sit with this necessity and the accountability that it requires. Spirit. Thank you so much, Spirit, for your comment. And I know that bringing this panel to root, it's, it's a big, it's, it's a lot. Because we need to inform everybody about disability, accessibility, accountability for who we are as artists. Uh, I would like uh, if uh, do we have any other comments? Yes, um, I have a, a Tallery has a comment, and this is for everyone viewing. If you know talented disabled artists, or if you are one, seriously, send me their your info. Seriously, that's how it happens. There's no magic sauce. Uh, email address is tallery.a.mccray at nationaldisabilitytheater.org. And they've put their information in the chat. Also, um, Doris, I am so grateful 
for this workshop. Have learned so much. So glad to see you all, especially Samuel. That, that's it. And I just uh, would like to thank the panelists uh, who I admire and look up to and seeing a fan in Tyler McGray and Jacob Kidd for being part of this. Thank you so much. I say we Thank can you, Sam. Well, mute and 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 show some, you know, audible appreciation. Thank you so much. It was Thank such you. a great panel. I learned so much. Thank you. Thanks, so y'all. Thank yes. you. Amazing. Thank you. Wonderful. Insightful. Thank you Thank again. You. Great to appreciate see you. you all. Great to Samuel, see you. you're such a great late night MC. Several years ago, <laughs> who knew you had all this talent? All this great talent. <laughs> but you know, he was, he was just showing out. You will do that. Thank you. Do that. <laughs> I think we're also uh, very privileged to have uh, Camille Schaefer here from Azul in North Carolina. Um, so, for our new uh, friends associated with National Disability Theater, Camille has been really instrumental and has been doing a lot of work around inclusion. Uh, for folks with disabilities for a number of years. So Camille, she's, she has Azul as her name. So that, <laughs> uh, that's who she is, but I just wanted to uplift her. Yes, yeah, like Camille. And thank, I'm wearing her thank color. You. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, thank you. I'm, I'm particularly excited about what, I, what Sean presented, um, of how you, how you are working with the technology in mm -hmm. design work because I have experience in both the performance aspects but also in scenic work and uh, so I was just really thrilled to see the work yeah, that you're doing in so scenic design and how thank you mm -hmm. yeah great I think this is our moment you know this is our moment where the technology is there for us to really think through how do we innovate with mm -hmm. disability theater. So it just feels like the time is right. Thank you for that. I found it very exciting. Come here. Yes. Would you like to say yes, something? Would you like to say something, Camille? Uh, yes, if you if you want to, yeah. Yes. What do I do? <laughs> you can say whatever you like, <laughs> or you can say nothing okay. if that's what you like. <laughs> you can also no, share. I, I'm very, very, Camille. I'm very happy to see what's happening right now. It is, this is really. Uh, you know, I've been working at Truth for many years, and to see this today is absolutely wonderful. So I am really, and thank you, Samuel. Samuel, I really thank you from the bottom of my heart. And thank you, Ruth. Y'all, this is Tallery. I just want to say we didn't even scratch the surface in terms of some of the cool things in that design. Our costume designer was Mallory K. Nelson, and her costumes were incredible. She basically was able to make magic with mostly like jeans and t-shirts, um, and she was great. And the other thing I wanted to just lift up um, is um, I really appreciate that this is a space where we're talking about disability justice, right, which really looks at those intersections of how when you really look at accessibility and access centered work, then you're actually, it's actually a liberatory process for several different groups, right, and several different lived experiences that have those intersections. So that's one thing that I know National Disability Theater is continuing to work on and with and through um, because it's tricky, I think. And sometimes even the name National Disability Theater um, 
can, it gets a little complicated and it gets a little messy. And so I think as an organization and as a new organization, we're kind of trying to embrace that mess as much as possible. Well, I just don't want to thank you so much for uh, writing with us in this uh, panel. Uh, again, I would like to thank the panelists for being a part of our Roots Week. Uh, it's just uh, grateful to be here with all of you. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. We dropped in the chat. If you want to hear more from Camille, Camille will be giving our pollination keynote next Saturday. So we're excited for that. Yes, um, it's in the, the chat um, Saturday at 9.30 a.m. Central. 10.30 Eastern, which is my real time. And uh, that will be keynote pollination uh, with Camille. So please, please, please join. And I wanna thank everyone, everyone for coming to this evening's presentation. Uh, I, uh, we, it was amazing. I learned so much, uh, I'm inspired and also um, convicted as in wanting to be more in, intentional with the work that I do and how I move forward as well. Um, next up this evening, we'll have studio visit and Freedom Map report back with Cherry and Ron. And we appreciate you all. And we wanna see you at 7.30 Central for that or 8.30 Eastern in the same Zoom link. The same Zoom link here. Thank y'all. Have a good cool Bye bye. Thank you, Lauren and Wendy and staff for everything that you have done. Thanks so much. Thank you, Samuel. This was so awesome. And I don't know if we could have gotten all these people at Luther Ridge. It would have been awesome if we could, and maybe we can in the future. But how, how wonderful it was to be able to take advantage of the technology and have your crew here. So thank you for doing all the behind the scenes work to make sure that happened. Amazing panel, you know. great work. Sad I can't bring you a beer right now though. I got one though. Oh, I know you do. I know you do, I was just gonna bring you another. That was over. You know we know each other. We go way back, Samuel. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Shout out to the tech team for working through these glitches. Yeah, thank you so much for everybody who worked on this. And I uh, really appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks, y'all. All right. Thank no you. after party. See y'all at 7.30 Central, 8.30 Eastern on the same Zoom. I have a show. I, I cannot be on that. But oh. I, uh, okay. Well, we'll see you tomorrow. Uh, yes. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye, -bye. y'all. I always like to see who's, who really stays. All right, Amy, I'm going to close it out. Yep. Thank you. Thank you for your hosting. And uh, we'll see you a little bit later. All righty. Bye.